I'm actually working with the productive communities that are constructing you know, this new society, these new economics. Peer-to-peer -peer is about, it's really a relational dynamic. It's the capacity that people now have to permissionlessly communicate with each other, peer-to-peer, -peer, but more importantly to organize themselves, right? To create huge transnational common goods, open knowledge, free software, open design. And you can combine that with distributed funding, social lending, crowdfunding. You can combine that with distributed machinery, 3D printing. Uh, you can combine that with new governance and ownership models. Uh, so basically you, you arrive at a vision which is completely different from the mainstream, you know, let's call it capitalist uh, system, where value is created by private people out of uh, pure selfish reasons, in theory, right? Um, and then companies capture the value and then they pay the workers and there's no civil society really in that, in that picture. Um, in the new picture, citizens are contributing to commons. These commons are abundantly available because they're mostly at this stage immaterial commons, uh, knowledge, design, but they're building economies around it. So they're trying to combine their capacity to contribute to something useful with creating livelihoods. And it's not easy, but it's happening and it's happening more and more. And I would say now we are each, we actually are arriving at the stage where instead of having, you know, just isolated projects, they are more and more finding each other. So we have kind of a meta system emerging. Uh, just in the last three weeks, I visited um, Madison, Wisconsin, where they have a mutual aid network that combines time banks, credit unions, food co-ops, and they're really making a system out of it, not just you know, individual projects. Uh, in Lille, uh, they have something called encommun.org, and they're identifying commons organizations, their physical commons, their immaterial commons, but also the streams of value, you know, how that works, right? Uh, I have other examples in Barcelona, there is a spiral in New Zealand. So we're arriving at a level now where you already see ecosystems emerging, not just doing Linux or doing Wikipedia, but actually real economic networks that share their knowledge, that where entrepreneurs uh, operate in transparency to each other, you know, open book accounting, open supply chains. You know, it has nothing to do with the industrial way of looking at how you produce value, it's really something different. The way it works is you have a commons at the core, that's where the value is contributed, and it's use value, something useful to people. But you still need to make a living, and that's where you create the economy around it, so you have abundant goods. Abundant goods are not economic goods, because you don't have a tension between supply and demand, right? Why would you pay for Linux so you can just download it? or even for music. You know, why would you pay for music if you can just download it? You could, you could say you should, but a lot of people would just pragmatically share it with each other. But musicians, you still want to hear them. You, still, you want to hear them live, so you pay them for their presence, you pay them for their performance. Um, and there's been studies, like in Norway, showing that today more music is produced, more music is listened to, and the musicians are making more money than 10 years ago. They're still complaining uh, because there's still a lot of precarity. But you know, compared to a situation where a few monopolies uh, take all the income and produce winner-take-all musicians that take all the money but leave everybody out, there's actually, despite public's perception, there is improvement uh, in, in the lives of many people who are engaged with that. Big industry is a choice, right? You say cars, you say, oh, we need big factories like in Germany and we need to mass produce cars. But that's a choice, it's not a necessity. You can say, let's make a Wikispeed, which is globally designed by, by an open design community of car engineers that is five times the fuel efficient as any car, industrial car from Germany. So much better for the environment. And you can produce it in a micro factory locally. Uh, so the, the rule is, if it's heavy, it's local, if it's light, it's global. Now why is this important? Because three quarter 
of the expenditure of matter and energy in our society is transport, not production. So you know, think about it, these, these little parts in the car today, they go around the world 24 times sometimes. It's insane. Why not make the car locally in a distributed way? It's a choice. It's not, it's not like you have to do it in the old way. You know, technology allows us to reimagine how production works, how value distribution can work. And of course, I'm not saying this is mainstream yet, but imagine in 10, 15 years when uh, oil could be $400. You know, are you still going to buy cheap cars from China? Probably not. You know, you're going to have to do it uh, much more locally. And so a lot of people are redesigning production chains, value chains, uh, food. You know, we want to eat healthy, non-toxic, organic food. Business is not doing it, so we'll do it ourselves, right? Consumer-supported agriculture. Now, these things existed before, but because of technology allows them to organize themselves in a much cheaper way than 15 years ago, they are rising exponentially. I'm observing grassroots initiatives and I try to have a role as a catalyst, which means identifying patterns that work and connecting them to each other. So imagine you live in the 15th century and there is a printing press. It completely changed the way how knowledge is diffused in society. It made you know, the religious reform possible, right? Then the Templars uh, invent double book accounting which completely changes the way people think about value. You know, it has to be in balance, input and output. Uh, you have Calvin that says being rich is actually a good thing and not sinful. So these are all patterns emerging at that time and nobody knows what really meant. But two centuries later, or three centuries later, that was capitalism basically, right? These patterns found each other. and from patterns became actually an organic ecosystem. This is happening the same thing today. We have crowdfunding there, social lending there, 3D printing here, new governance models there, new ownership models there. And people say, oh, things are changing, but they don't know how they are changing. And I'm making this bold claim that we can actually already see the underlying structure of society that is coming. And you know, I'm not like saying it will be absolutely like that. It's it's you know, it's it's society. It's about power. It's about struggle. It's about innovation. Uh, but I make scenarios, different scenarios. But the one I hope, you know, is this scenario of the global commons, with open communities collaborating and sharing innovation, and then uh, local, more cooperative forms of economy, producing it in a sustainable way, closer to the people. And basically three things need to come together. The open economy, the sustainable economy, and the solidary economy, right? So now we have, for example, open source circular economy. That's the first conversion between the open model and the sustainable model. And we have something called open cooperativism. It's the first conversion between the open model and the cooperative model. So I'm saying, and I, you know, I'm, because I'm seeing it happening, I'm saying it's happening. You know, it's not utopian, it's actually happening. It doesn't mean everything will be perfect, but, you know, people are simply responding to real crisis, right? And some people have an anticipatory consciousness. They just see earlier than others the problems that are, you know, being created by this type of economy, and they say we need to do something about it. It's very important they do this now because when there is a big crisis, right, people look for solutions. And if we don't have these healthy solutions, people will look for unhealthy solutions. As you know, in Germany, this is a big, you know, this can happen in, in, in history, right? So we, we're basically trying to create the conditions that when there is a need for a bigger shift, that there are already models there that people can be inspired by and copy and, you know, innovate on. Three weeks ago, I was in Madison, Wisconsin. And, you know, you have like Main Street USA, which is there called State Street. Every third shop on that street says organic, zero mile, sweatshop free, um, et cetera, et cetera. This means that after every store, there is a, behind every store, there is a network, right? If you say fair trade, 
that means they have a connection with Ecuadorian coffee makers. There's there's a supply chain. It just it's not just the name on, on the on the window, right? That's one thing. The next thing is that there's already people there, and this is called a mutual aid network project that are putting together things. For example, there's a very successful time bank in Madison, and there's a credit union. What people couldn't do is take their time dollars and use them f for the credit union, right? And use them for the food co-op. So what they're doing now is creating an ecosystem, uh, trying to create value streams in the common good economy so that people doing food co-op you know, can connect with people doing healthcare. Uh, and there's lots of new models of healthcare like solidarity co-ops for social care. There's so many things happening, it's really unbelievable. You just have to want to see it. I think the big problem is that media just don't talk about it. It's not exciting, you know? People are not killing each other, they're actually constructing something. And it's slow going, it's like the boiling frog in a good way, right? Uh, and so that's why they don't see it. And it's also challenging for mainstream media because it challenges the vision of man, right? The idea that we're only motivated by selfish uh, behaviors. And I'm not denying that people can be selfish and are selfish. I'm just denying that this is the only thing they are, right? That people are complex beings and if you create good social systems, they can express different parts of their being more easily and then uh, have uh, social systems that are you know, more rich in their motivations, that people do things for more than one reason, not just you know, the, the selfish reason to get money for something, right?